Hey everybody, Johnny here. In this video, we're going to take a look at UV unwrapping in geometry nodes. We're going to use some of the new tools in Blender 3.3 to make it a little easier. So let's jump right into it. So for this example, we're going to go ahead and create a curve. Then we'll add a node tree, add a curve to mesh node, and a curve primitive circle. Now that we have a solid tube, let's go ahead and add a material to it. Here I'm using the assets from Polyhaven. Make sure to give them a visit. I'll drag this rusty metal texture onto our tube. And then in our node tree, add a set material node. And choose the material we just added. Of course, the first thing you'll notice is that we didn't get the texture we were expecting. Instead, we've gotten ourselves a giant macaroni and cheese noodle. Let's see why that is. If I duplicate this object and bring it over here and then convert this to a mesh using the convert to mesh operator, we can take a look at it. Nothing seems odd at the moment, so let's go look at its UVs. As we can see, it doesn't actually have a UV map and that's part of the problem. So just one point from our texture is being applied to the entire model. That's why it's all the same color. We'll delete this one and go back to our original model. So what we're gonna need to do is add our own UV map to this. To do that, we're gonna need an attribute to store that value in. So we'll use a store named attribute node and plug it in. We'll need to give it a name, something like UV map. One point here is don't name this UV because if you just name it UV, Cycles won't work with that very well. I think that's a bug that needs to be fixed. Now, the type for our UV map is going to be vector. Now the vectors so far in geometry nodes have all been three dimensional vectors. A UV coordinate is just two dimensional. So the third dimension here is completely ignored. Now we also have to say where we want to store this information. UV maps are stored in face corners. This means that every corner of every face can have its own place on the UV map. Now that we have an attribute to fill, we'll use the UV unwrap node and plug it in. We're not seeing this update yet in our shader. So let's go over to the shading menu and see why. Currently, our UV mapping is coming from the built-in UV map texture coordinate. But since we created our own custom attribute, we'll need to get rid of this and add in an attribute node. The attribute name we created was UV map and the type was vector. Now we're still not seeing any of our texture on our object. So let's go back over to geometry nodes one more time. Currently, the UV unwrap is having a little trouble because our object it doesn't have any seams, so it doesn't know how to unwrap it. You'll see in the UV unwrap node, we have a seam input. This is evaluated along the edges. So if an edge has a value of true, it will be placed as a seam for the UV unwrapping. Let's go ahead and set all of the edges to true and see what we get. We'll use an input Boolean node, set it to true and connect it to seam. There, we finally have something. This is what you would get if you had an object in edit mode, selected all of the edges, marked them all as seams, and did a UV unwrap. Of course, this isn't what we need. So let's try something else. There's a couple of ways we could approach this problem, and the model you're trying to unwrap will determine what kind of tactic you use to unwrap it. In this case, we would probably want to mark seams along the end caps and then perhaps one seam down the middle. So how might we accomplish this? Like I said, each model is going to be different. In this case, we notice that the faces on the end caps are really large and the rest of the faces are really small. So perhaps we could choose the edges that are on any faces that are above a certain size. Under mesh, we can choose face area. Then we want to say when this is greater than a certain size. Right now, everything is greater than zero, so we're getting the same result we had before. 
but let's increase this size. Once we've gotten above the face area of the small faces, but still less than the end caps, the edges around that have now been marked as true and are now being used as seams. But what about our seam up the middle? Again, there's a bunch of ways we could attack this. First, we're going to want to combine this selection that we already have with our new selection. So, we'll do that using a Boolean math node and set it to OR. So the end cap edges that are marked will be in the top socket and whatever we plug into the bottom socket that's true will also turn into a seam. One handy thing you can do when trying to figure out the topology of your mesh is to use a delete geometry node. I'm going to put it here towards the end. And then I'll add an input index, set it to equal, and then plug that into the selection. Next, I'll change the delete type to edge. And let's go into flat shaded mode. For extra help in visualizing what we're doing, I'm going to go to the object panel, go down to viewport display, and turn on wireframe. Now we can clearly see that we're erasing edge zero, and edge zero is right here. If I increase this, we'll see that edge one is right there and that the edges run up the length of our tube. And so edge number 11 is the last edge in this line. So the simplest thing to do here would be to select any edge with an index of less than 12. We'll duplicate the index node, duplicate this compare, and set it to less than, set this to 12, and then connect it to our OR. We'll toggle off wireframe mode and see what we got. Now, other than the seam down the side here, we've actually applied our material pretty well. And now, if we duplicate this, convert it to a mesh, go to our mesh data panel, we'll go in, down into the attributes area and convert this attribute to a UV map. If we go to our UV editor and select all the vertices, we'll see the UV map that was created. Of course, we might not always have something as convenient as having the edges we want to mark in a seam all right in a line with each other like this, so that we can just select them with a single number. Other times, we might want to make a path between one point and another without knowing much about what's in between. We can use the new shortest edge path tools that are in Blender 3.3 to help accomplish this. We'll duplicate our example and make a copy of our geometry node tree. In this tree, we're gonna delete the index is less than 12. This way we still have our end caps, but now we wanna generate the connection point from here to here. To do this, we're gonna use the mesh edge paths to selection node. We'll plug that into the OR of our Boolean. Next, we need to indicate our start vertices. For that, we'll just use an index input, set it to equal, and we'll start with zero. Remember, we're working with the indices of the vertices here. We're not working with the edge indices right now. So vertex number one will be selected as the start. Now we need to add a mesh shortest edge paths node, connect the next vertex index to the next vertex index of our edge paths to selection. Again, we'll duplicate this equals node, plug in the index, and then plug the result into the end vertex. So now we can adjust these two values to select any two vertices on our object. So let's use our delete geometry trick to find out what vertex we're gonna to wanna to select. We'll plug in our delete geometry node in our selection and turn on wireframe. What we see is that the vertex number increases along each ring of our tube, not along each side section like the edges did. So we'll continue to bring this up 
until we find where we want. It turns out Vertex 384 is the one we're looking for. If we put 384 here, we find we get the same result. Now, if we grabbed all of these nodes and grouped them together with Control G, we could plug these two points into the input. We'll call them point one and point two. And we can call it something like vertex path selection. Now, as you're working with these, you may want some visual feedback on what your UV layout is starting to look like. Before, we had to convert this to a mesh, change its attribute to a UV map, and then we could see what the UV map looked like. It'd be nice to have a faster way to view the UV map while you're making these changes. Let me show you one way to do that. If I take my object before I output it and duplicate it with a duplicate elements node, I'll change the element type to face. So now every face in my model has a copy and none of them are connected. I'm going to join this with my original geometry. Right at first, you'll probably see some nasty Z fighting as these two meshes are overlaying each other perfectly. So what we'll want to do is move our new copies. We'll use a geometry set position node but instead of setting each point based on the 3D position, we're going to set it based on a UV value. If I take an input, named attribute node, set the type to vector, and choose my UV map, and plug that into position, that second mesh is going to disappear. However, if I go into wireframe mode and zoom in a little bit, you'll see something that looks extraordinarily like a UV map. And it's located at the origin of this object. So let's move it a little using the offset. And next, if we want to see the layout, we could use a geometry, delete geometry node, and delete only faces. So now as we change these values, we can see what kind of map we're getting. Of course, if it's too small, you could add a geometry transform node and make it a little larger. Let's go ahead and make this into a node group as well. I'll grab these nodes and press Control G. The geometry is connected to the outside. Let's also connect the name of the UV map attribute. And then let's add in an option for whether or not we want to have the faces shown. We can do that with a utility switch node, connecting the whole geometry to true and the deleted faces with false. Then we can connect the switch to an input and name that show faces. And finally, we could plug in the scale to the input. So now we have a show UV node. We'll mark that as an asset and we can use this now anytime to take a geometry and get its node tree. Let's jump back over to this one and see it in action. There it is. Of course, we also might want to be able to move it around, so let's go ahead and add that as well. We could plug in either the Transforms Translation or the Set Position Nodes Offset. For this one, I'm just going to use the Set Positions Offset, since that's what we were using before. Now that we have a way to visualize this, Let's look at one last thing we can do. Let's look how we can manipulate these UVs, much like the vector mapping node. If we take our UV output, first let's turn on show faces. Since our UV output is really just a two dimensional vector, we can use vector math on this line to make changes to our UV map. If I choose a vector math node and leave it in add mode, 
and add to the X, you'll see that our UV map moves sideways along its mapping. This is different than when we used our UV mapping node, because you notice here when we change this, the result doesn't change on our mesh. All we're doing is moving the visualization of the map around. Here, the map is staying in the same place, and it's our UV map's position on that plane that's moving. So that will move us side to side and up and down. What if we want to make this larger or smaller? To do that, we'll duplicate our vector math node and set the type to scale. It's changing the positions of our UV map and stretching it out further and further. Finally, what if we wanted to rotate it? For that, we can use a vector rotate node. There's a bunch of different ways you could use this, but probably the most intuitive would be to use the Z-axis rotation. So if we spin it using the Z-axis, we get this result. And if we don't want it rotating from that corner, we can simply change the center of rotation. So that's an initial rundown of using some UV maps in geometry nodes. If you're having trouble with them, I hope this clears up some confusion. And at the same time, I hope it doesn't cause any more confusion than you already had. While there wasn't too much to these particular source files, you'll find them and the source files of my videos going forward from now on posted there. Also for my patrons, if you have an older video that you'd like to request a source file for, you're more than welcome to do that. And before we finished, I do want to give a shout out to my patrons. So as always, I hope this inspires you to make something awesome, and until next time, I'll catch you later.